All right, hi everyone. So uh, this is the uh, Hacker Hour on Web Development with Flask and MongoDB. Um, so just before we, oh yeah, my name. My name is Aditya. I'm a junior, um, and go for it. Yeah. Jesus Christ, this is gonna be so bad. All right. Hello everyone. My name is Mihai, and I'm a senior. Um, I'm just gonna hold it. All right. So first, um, obviously, we need to talk about what web development is, right? So just a little introduction on this. Um, so web development, uh, in short, is a way to build applications that can live on the internet, right? So things you use every day, like Google and like the Google Search or your Instagram app, it's, it, they're all um, applications that live on the internet, right? And that's that's what we're going to be doing today. Yeah. So um, the way this works is mainly through some, something called a client-server model, and uh, this is basically a way of kind of splitting up the whole, um, I guess, structure into two main halves, so it becomes easier to kind of coordinate, right? So uh, for when you look at something like Google or, or Instagram, let's take Instagram, right? You have the mobile app, which is full of all the buttons and the and the pictures and uh, everything that you see, and there's all the hidden stuff that happens in the background, like log logging in or, or storing pictures or following people. That all happens in the background. So th those are the two main parts: the client, which is the front the front part, the front end that you see, and the back end, which is the, all the hidden stuff that happens. Uh, I guess when you're not I guess when you're not using the app. Um, did I miss anything with that? No, I think we're good. So you, you want to talk about Yeah, it? I could. All right, so just to, like, uh, I guess provide a little bit more um, context to that. So while the client-server uh, model gives us, like, a nice, like, abstraction of how to, like, reason about how, like, what happens when you run a web application, what happens when you use, like, uh, Instagram, like Aditya said, uh, to, if we're actually going to uh, hope to do web development, we have to get into a little bit more of the specifics. So in particular, uh, the big thing we need to talk about here is uh, how we actually perform communication. Uh, over the internet with respect to web applications, and that's through uh, HTTP, uh, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And what this basically does is uh, provides us a structured way for uh, clients to interact with servers, basically. And in particular, um, what this enables us to do from the client is to uh, send uh, structured requests, and then for the server, that's supposed to be handling all these requests to uh, get the response, decode it, and do whatever it is that the client requested. So the way the HTTP does this primarily is through a series of methods. Um, and each uh, individual method delineates a different type of action that you can take uh, on the back end or a different type of like, request you can make to the server. So the most, uh, I guess the two most common are uh, post and get requests. Um, HTTP get is the, probably the most simple, straightforward uh, type of HTTP request you can have out there because all you do there is really just requesting uh, data. So whenever I, like, I go to type in, let's say, www.google.com, that's sending a GET request uh, using HTTP to Google servers to give me the web page that uh, is Google's homepage, basically. Right? I'm, uh, as the client, I'm requesting a resource from the server. Okay, but uh, obviously it's not just, it's not very, the internet wouldn't be very useful if all you could do is request data. Obviously, uh, we want to be able to send data as well, and that's where HTTP post comes in. Uh, whereas GET lets us uh, request data, uh, post lets us actually send data to the um, uh, actual server. So, uh, continuing with the Google example, this might be like if, for example, I am uh, creating an account uh, with like Gmail or something like that. Uh, I, I type in all my uh, information, and uh, once I uh, hit like create account, that information gets sent to Google, and they create an account for me on the back end that I can then use from here on out. So, and also there's one more. There's a bunch of others, but the other one that's I guess it's worth mentioning is a delete. Sometimes uh, some web apps will give you the functionality to actually like send delete requests, like if, like, let's say, I don't know, you wanted to delete an old email, that might be done with an HTTP delete request. So you get the, you get the idea, like, there's a, just a bunch of different ways that we can uh, use HTTP to um, do the things we want to do with our applications. So, uh, but just like the same way that uh, clients can issue uh, HTTP requests, so we're using the different methods, uh, the server can actually uh, send back a certain uh, response codes to indicate, like, what actually is happening on the back end. So... Uh, these are done through the HTTP response codes, and um, again, there's like a lot of, uh, to actually discuss. There's like uh, of many, many of them, but the most uh, important to mention are like the failure cases. So if you've ever uh, tried to go to a website and you've gotten uh, HTTP 404 uh, not found, that's like pretty clearly um, a response from a server that the requested resource couldn't be found anywhere on, on the server. And then the really bad one, that one's like sort of like, you know, that, that happens from time to time, but the really bad one is uh, HTTP 500. That means that some, there was like usually like some like... Uh, crash on the server side and that's like usually like a no-no so uh yeah i guess the next thing is that so now uh does anyone have any questions i guess before we move on about anything that a digit i have discussed go ahead
what yeah. Ah, so um, that's actually a fa fantastic question. So without getting into too much of the details, um, the server's uh, located at an unspecified uh, location. It's just, uh, there's a bunch of different protocols that actually gets us uh, where the server is. So namely, I mean, I don't want to get too out. Imagine, yeah. imagine that, uh, yeah, go ahead. Imagine there's just like my laptop, right, sitting in somewhere in the middle of Kansas. That's pretty much like Google's like server. Okay. Uh, it's just that, it's not a laptop and it's not in Kansas, but it's like a lot bigger. Like they have like thousands of these spread out all over the world. And when you send Google, like type in into your browser, google.com, um, your browser knows like, so if you heard of like IP address, that's kind of like a home address, kind of like your street address. So the browser knows what Google's address is. And like you said, I don't want to go into too much detail, but it just like kind of navigates to that like address. That's where Google's located. And then it comes back with the response through that same route, kind of. Can I answer the question? Yeah. All right. And just like a little, um, I guess, uh, to add on to that, if you're really interested to know like how this sort of thing works, I would highly recommend you take uh, Internet Technology 352 because they like you spend a whole semester learning about like the little bitty details of like what happens when you type in Google.com, and like from like the bit la layer level to like uh, HTTP. So yeah, any other questions before we move on? Are we set? All right. Uh, do you want to take this? Yeah, sure. Um, so. Uh, like we said, now there's the two parts, right? There's a front, uh, front end and the back end. Um, this hacker we're focusing mo mostly on the back end. Um, so the front end is, like I said, is the visuals. And there's a lot of ways to do that. I'm sure you guys, some of you have heard of HTML um, and CSS and all that stuff. Um, and again, that's a whole different, uh, I guess, field of engineering. We're going to be focusing on the back end. So what we're focusing on is how do you actually handle incoming requests from the client? Um, so if I were Google, I would need to create a server that's able to listen for people making accounts, sending emails, um, uploading files to Google Drive. So they tell me, hey, I want to upload a file, and I have to say, okay, I'll do that, and then get back to you saying, okay, done. So that's what we're going to be doing. So something called Flask, or sorry, something called a, fr uh, a framework allows us to do this uh, in a very, I guess, simple way because it, it uh, does a lot of the small uh, work for us and lets you focus on the major um, aspects. And this will be clear once we like go on, but it's just know that uh, a framework is something that just simplifies the task of making a server for you. And Flask is just one of these frameworks and it's in Python. Um, so we're, we're, we're not assuming you know Python or anything, uh, but Python is a pretty simple language, it's almost like English, so it shouldn't be too difficult. Um, and why Flask over others? Well, it's just a lot simpler, it's a lot less like overhead um, and a lot more intuitive, so that's why we chose to use Flask. All right. <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah, Aditya did a good, pretty good job of explaining the, uh, I guess, the motivation for, like, why we need a web framework and why we're going to be using Flask. But uh, another thing that we're going to need that's maybe not so obvious is a means to store our data. Uh, in particular, because while now we have, like, with Flask, we have the means by which we can handle HTTP requests and do different things, uh, we're still going to end up uh, needing somewhere to like, store our data so we can access it whenever. And uh, a database is where that comes into play. I mean, a database fundamentally at its core is uh, some technology that stores data and uh, provides some sort of language that you can uh, access the data in a fast way. Okay, and uh, this is done through database queries and the database that we're gonna be using today is uh, MongoDB. So um, it turns out, uh, depending on how you actually set it up, these uh, databases can be done like on like a commodity like server or something or uh, like locally. Uh, or it can be somewhere done somewhere on the internet in the cloud. So you can like, uh, like so actually Mo MongoDB offers this service, uh, Atlas, where you can just basically ask them like, spin me up a database, and uh, they, you won't know where it is in the world, but like it'll just be there, and you'll it'll, be able it'll to just store your data like somewhere, and you can and you can just access that data. That's yeah. Yeah. So uh, it turns out uh, we're not actually not going to be using MongoDB Atlas uh, for this one. We thought we were, but. Uh, it's a little bit more, like, more complicated than we I'd hoped it would be for like a simple presentation. So uh, yeah, and uh, just before I move on, I guess uh, a couple of things to know about MongoDB, like the actual technology itself. Uh, oh, go ahead. Question in the back. Yeah. So is the database uh, on the server? It's um, so it's not on the server. So it's it's you can think of it as like a separate uh, like entity, but the server is going to be communicating with it. So the server is the one that handles requests, and the database stores data, and then the server just like if it needs to store any data, it goes to the database, says, hey, store this. If it needs to get data, it goes to the database and says, hey, give me this data, and so on. So where is the database? Um, it's just another, it's just another like, location in the internet. Just like another, like I, like I answered her question, it's just like another box somewhere 
uh, with its own address and the server that communicates with it. Um, I don't know how. Yeah, I'll just say. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, again, it, so ultimately, it depends on where your database actually is. Depends on what solution you're using. So, if you install your database, if you set up your database locally, you can just literally have it on a machine like that exists somewhere that you okay, control. Let me, let me just like pull it up here. Hold on. So Sorry. this might. Oh yeah. So. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make a database like on my laptop. So to start MongoDB. Uh, we're, we were going to get to this later, but it might answer your question better. So you can just, there's this command called mongod. Is this big enough? Oh, it's, I think it's already running. Um, so right now I'm connected to my database. So there's a database living on my computer right now. And I can, I can, I can run this command called show databases. And now it shows the databases that are on my computer. So I don't have any right now. I can make a new one use, uh, using this command, use new da database. Um, and it makes a new database, and I can insert data using certain commands. So like, all this is happening on my computer, and this can just be happening on another computer somewhere else. That's it's just like a computer somewhere, and the server will communicate with that computer. Yeah. So I mean, in short, the database can sort of exist like wherever you want it to, depending on how you set it up. Yeah. So like this is a command. I don't know the exact syntax. Something like this. So if you want to insert something into the database, like this is a command you'd use. But again, we'll get to all of this like later. Okay. Um. I guess just, oh, yeah, let me see that. So, I guess, like, before we move on to actually, I guess, like, uh, doing the uh, live coding, I guess, uh, I just want to, like, talk, touch on a little bit on how MongoDB is structured. So, um, typically, uh, I guess most databases traditionally are in this sort of relational format where you have these, uh, you know, you have, like, like, these sort of tables defined by, uh, you know, columns and rows and so on and so forth, sort of like Microsoft Excel. But uh, just out of, actually by show of hands, uh, who here has ever used, like, SQL before? Raise your hand. Who here has used MongoDB before? Okay, so split down the middle. It's okay. So I guess we're MongoDB sort of like uh, so this is like again this is the sort of conventional database model, right? You have your attributes and you have your instances of those attributes, right? Uh, what MongoDB sort of tries to do a little differently is they uh, do this have this document model where these uh, JSON documents, so basically a bunch of uh, key value pairs in like one like file if you want, uh, are stored in these uh, groups of uh, documents called collections and. Uh, the idea here is that MongoDB is a lot more flexible with how you can like access data and manipulate it compared to relational databases where there's a lot of restrictions. In the back? What are instances? Uh, so come again? What are instances? So um, an instance is like an actual like instantiation of something. So like let's say if I had like a collection for my users, let's say. Wait, is he oh. asking what instance it would be better to use MongoDB? Or like what, what is an instance? Oh. So when I say when I say an instance, I mean to say that like um, typically collections, they're usually or like even like tables in SQL, they're um, they usually denote like so there's will be like a group of something that's like logically related. So if I had like a, a users collection or a users table, an instance of a user would be like an actual user that like exists that has like attributes, like right? Like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's what I mean to say like it's like an actual like uh, user that exists and it's stored in my database, I guess, or an actual message or something or other. That's what I mean to say. Why is MongoDB better? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a tricky, that's a complicated question. Uh, so without getting into it too much, okay, so for just like a little bit of background, uh, Aditya and I both like interned for MongoDB last summer. So gonna I'm gonna be working there full time in the summer. So um, for the starters, they're like employing me. So that's like super cool. <laughs> uh, that's why I think they're much better than any like SQL company out there. But uh, I don't think, okay, so I don't think like MongoDB is like categorically better than like SQL. It's just I think that MongoDB does certain things better than uh, any sort of SQL solution does. So uh, typically I would say that MongoDB is really uh, good when you have unstructured data. When you have like a lot of data coming in and you do not, there's no guarantees on how it might be structured. MongoDB performs much, much better in my opinion than SQL does. And that's where I think, I think Mongo really like shines the use case. So uh, in that instance, I would say MongoDB is better. But there are, are instances where like I wouldn't use MongoDB over yeah, SQL. I, what you asked is a really interesting question, and I would encourage you to like actually look into it because this is like an open thing. Like every business has to decide like what's the best thing for them. So, good question though. Yeah. So yeah, there it, the answer is it depends. Uh, does anyone else have any questions before we move on to doing live coding? Go ahead. Is it hard? I mean, is it easier to, to write complex queries with MongoDB or no? Oh, uh, I would say um, I don't know. In my experience. I think the query language is a lot, I think it's a lot simpler to grasp, I think, because it's very, like, um, modular. Yeah. Like, you can, like, sort of, like, there's, like, basically, the, the, the easiest way they do it is, like, you have, like, a pipeline, which is basically just a series of commands that are going to ultimately, like, filter your data, let's say. So you just say, like, oh, I want all um, documents that are, have 
this field set to some value. And then you could do like a bunch of like operations like that, like together. Whereas like in a relational database, you have to do everything like in one query or have like a bunch of sub queries. Yeah, and it gets like very more intuitive to me, at least. But again, yeah. I might be biased. This is a totally subjective like answer, by the way. 1000% subjective answer. Like don't like say like, oh, but Mihai said, Mihai and Nidia said like, MongoDB is categorically better. Like we totally didn't. So, yeah. Any other questions? Before we move on? Yeah, we should. All right. Let's do yeah. Um, so how are we doing this now? All right. So uh, basically what we're going to do is we're just going to like, uh, like we uh, did just sort of said, uh, we're not going to focus so much on the front end here, but um, we're going to be building an, an instance of tiny row where we already have like the front end set up. And we're going to explain how you like the database works into it and how like we basically take all the stuff that we just like learned about at like a high level and put them into practice. Okay. So um, uh, we're going to be building, a, like I said, a clone of tiny URL. So first we're going to show you, I guess, like what the finished product should look like. And then we're gonna like delete like the whole uh, file, and then I guess our full like server. We're gonna build it up again. Yeah. So like like we said, we're gonna, we're skipping like the um, oh you weren't tying the mic, but it's oh, fine. Oh my bad. Cool. Um, <laughs> we uh, we're skipping like the front end part, so all of the coloring, all the styling, and everything. We're skipping that. Um, but okay, so this is how it's gonna work. If we have a long URL, I'm just gonna go with Google.com or something, and short URL, I'm just gonna say like foo. So. All right, so it's telling us uh, this is a URL shortened to localhost foo. Now, if I go here, it should redirect me to google.com. Let's see if that works. Please work. There Please we go. See. Okay. So that's works. that's our goal. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Thank cool. Uh, so that's what we're going to be building today. Yeah. So now, just should I just delete from? We're just going to delete everything, and we're going to build it up again and show you how it's done. It's like bye bye. See you, uh, server code. Uh, we're going to start from the beginning. All right, you, I'll, I guess I can start. So, um, how do we do this? So, uh, the first thing we want to do uh, is like handle some of the like Flask specific stuff that'll get us up and running. So, in particular, the first thing we always need to do with the Flask app is we need to actually import uh, the Flask library that's going to let us do stuff. So yeah. So we're this is just an import statement, uh, importing the actual Flask thing, Flask server, <laughs> I guess, and then uh, we have to make a new Flask application using this command. So. Flask and then it goes. Oh, uh, can you make it bigger? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. And again, so um, we were actually talking to, to Maya about this. We don't. In, we we intend to not have you follow along just because it's gonna get really complicated and like if everyone gets lost and like it'll just waste a lot of time. But we're gonna put all the code up and put like step by step instructions. So just try to follow along, understand what's going on, and uh, yeah. So we make this Flask app, um, and now. Uh, so we talked about handling incoming requests, right? So we need to define something called a route. And a route is basically the, the um, way to handle an incoming client's request. So something very simple looks like this. So you say at app.route, and then you give it a URL, which I'll come back to later. So you give it this URL, and you define a method. Let's call it index. And then you can be like, return like hello, right? Is it, would that work? I think no, that should, this should, this should actually this work. Should work. So what's going to end up happening here is that when we actually go run our server and visit the uh, that uh, route, so the home page, basically, it's going to be the case that uh, uh, it's going to print hello. Well, I guess it's because we, it's not going to work here because we have like a whole front end set up. Wait, but it should work, I think. Am I in the wrong thing? Oh, yeah, I'm in the wrong thing. Uh, cannot import Flask. It's just uppercase Flask, I think, for that one. So oh, yeah. one is uppercase, yeah. There you go. Now try it. All right, so it just says hello. So that's like the very simple um, way a route works. Yeah, so our, you can see like our server's running. Uh, when it got the request to go to the home page, it executed the code on the back end, which was just simply return a string, and what the client basically got that string. Right? Yeah. By um, the way, and, and so if you have any questions, obviously. Yeah. Oh, OK, so we're running this like, so this is like, uh, because we're like building like a toy app, if you want, we're running this locally. And uh, so the URL we're running it at is uh, localhost uh, port 5000. So whenever you uh, build an app locally, to, and then like just like a toy app, typically what happens is you test it locally first. And it's where it's, if you try to go to localhost, you won't be able to because it's only accessible to a digitous computer. And um, yeah, and so yeah. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, and also one more thing, if I were to change this to blah here, then now if I rerun this and I go to my browser and I go localhost 5000, it's going to say not found because I changed it to blah. And if I go to slash blah, 
now it should work. So that, that's basically the way you correspond your browser is like routing to this routing. Um, that's like the, the match, basically. So now, um, let's see what's next. So now should we, the lot, this part? So now we should probably talk about the, um, how we might uh, handle post and get requests. All right. So just, oh yeah, go for it. Oh yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. No yeah, sure. Let me see the mic really quickly. Yeah, go for it. So before we move on, is everyone like uh, on board? Like, does everyone understand sort of what's going on? I guess. All right, good. Okay, so um, now was sort of what we talked about. Uh, if we recall from like the little demo we had, where we show we, we showed how like the um, final projects would look like, what ended up happening was that we had a form where people could submit uh, long URLs and short URLs, and submit it, and then eventually uh, access that short URL. Right. So um, who can tell me how we might like frame that? Uh, in terms of the uh, HTTP methods that we described earlier. Does anyone know? Any guesses? Go ahead. You can have the get route will just redirect you, but the post route for just anything uh, like body would basically be the long URL. Right, exactly. So um, like sort of we described with the HTTP methods, uh, get is typically used uh, for the client to uh, issue a request to get a resource. And post is uh, for the a way for the, by means a means by which the a client can send a resource to the server, right? So in this case, we're gonna have uh, the get route, uh, basically again be the landing point where we can either redirect someone with a short URL or provide the homepage where people can enter data, and then people actually want to send us a long URL short URL combo. That's gonna be done via post request. Does that make sense? So, okay. Yeah. Now I'll just explain what I wrote up here. So. Um, like me, I said, we have to separate the functionality for a post or a get request, right? So uh, the way Flask does that is you just go to this request.method, um, I guess, like attribute, and you check what it is. So for, I'm ignoring post request for now. We'll just deal with get requests. And uh, all that says is if it's a get request, I'm returning. So I'm rendering this page, index.html. And index.html is simply just the web page that you see, see in, the, uh, in the original thing. So if I run this again, you're going to see, hopefully, Oh my God, this indentation stuff. Yeah, it's okay. You have to actually like, put something, I think, below the if, right? Oh, uh, do I? I think so. Here, hold it. Here you go. Oh, I can put path. Amazing. So if they send a post request, we're going to do nothing for the time being. Oh no. Oh, yeah. hold on. Oh, so. Dude, live coding is always a stressful thing. Yeah. So it turns out, uh, so uh, what Aditya is like coding up right now is a lot of uh, Flask built-ins. So Flask provides, th this is like sort of what we talked about with the usefulness of a framework. Uh, Flask provides us a lot of different ways in which we can uh, do, uh, like have Flask do the sort of heavy lifting for us and not have us really worry about it. So one example is this uh, render template function. So as you might imagine, for us to like actually send like a web page to like, uh, I guess like a user on the, the, like a client that actually requests that web page might be like a lot of work. Again, if you want to know what that work looks like, take uh, internet technology. But fortunately, we don't care about that because we have a powerful web framework that can sort of handle that for us. So all, all we need to do is for us to send a web page back to our client, we just need to call Flask render template thing and it's going to work automatically. So, and also similarly, uh, instead of having to like figure out how we're going to decode like a different HTTP response and stuff, Flask also has another a useful thing for us with that regard, uh, which is basically just the uh, request library. And that's basically the way that we're going to try to, uh, we're going to use Flask's power to like filter uh, what's a get request, what's a post request, and make it really easy for us to just think about the logic of our application. Okay. Uh, any questions uh, about any of that? All right. Cool. Um, so next thing now is to actually allow the user to send a long URL and a short URL and then to um, store that in our database and make sure that they can access it later. So first thing we need to do is set up a connection to our database. So right now what I have done, I think I should have it here. Yeah. So ignore this. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start my database on my computer. So that's done using command mongod. And now that what that just what that does is all it does is starts my MongoDB database on this computer on port twenty seven thousand seventeen. Um, again, ports and stuff is like a very internet technology kind of thing. There's no, it's like a part of your computer and you access it using localhost. So um, to connect to this, I do uh, first, I need to import the, uh, the library that lets Python communicate with MongoDB and that's called uh, PyMongo. 
So I've installed it before. Um, again, we'll, we'll put all the instructions up. From PyMongo, I'm going to import this uh, library that lets me communicate with MongoDB. And if you want to jump in at any point, yeah. feel free. So then what I do is I connect to it using this uh, method, Mongo client. So like I said, it's at localhost and at port 27,017. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, just like, don't worry too much about this like sort of like setup. This is like, uh, I mean, I guess this is just like uh, the, the legwork for us to get uh, a connection between our server and our database. Okay, so clearly you saw uh, that uh, Aditya opened up the database and it's actually like running on his, actively running on his computer. Now, uh, within the actual server, we need to connect, uh, get a connection to uh, that database so that we can actually do stuff with it. It's so, like write to it and eventually query from it. Does that make sense? So don't worry too much about what the, what's actually happening. I mean, really, it's just we're uh, creating a we're we're creating a uh, client object that lets us interface with the database that is at uh, port twenty seven thousand seventeen on the on the local machine. And if right? you Google like PyMongo and stuff, you'll get hundreds of tutorials and stuff. So it's pretty it's pretty simple. Um, all right, so now uh, we need to. When the user sends a, uh, when the user submits this form, right, uh, we're gonna get these two things, the long URL and the short URL, to our server. So the way we access those things is using again Flask's um, request object, and this is how it looks. So you're gonna, we're gonna define a variable long URL, which is request. Dot form. So form is an inbuilt Flask thing again that lets you access forms, um, and we want the long URL. And then we're going to get the short URL, too. All right, so now these two variables should have the two pieces of the form. And now we're going to store uh, this pair in our database. So uh, the way you do that is first you need to have a collection of these like pairs, I guess. So I'm going to call that collection. And then I'll say, you want to explain what I'm doing here? Yeah, so like I sort of like, oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, we've been like uh, more or less whatever about the mic, but uh, so as I sort of talked about when I ta gave you like an overview of what MongoDB does, um, MongoDB is a database, so MongoDB is fundamentally going to be responsible for storing our data. But the way that it's structured is is that uh, data is segmented into these things called documents, which are then stored in collections. So uh, and sort of like I said, um, a collection is really just like a way to like group like related things together. So in this case, our collection is going to be uh, URL pairings, so mappings of uh, Long or, or short URL to long URL. So um, our, basically our collection is going to be that uh, mapping, I guess. And uh, really it's going to be a, a sequence of series of documents that just have, um, they're just uh, long URL and short URL together in like yeah. one document. So I, like me, I said I initialized that collection over here. And the collection is called URL maps. So like the name suggests, it's going to be a mapping of URLs. And then once I get the long and short URL, I insert into that collection. Um, again, this is an inbuilt method. I insert the pair of short URL and long URL. And then we're going to access this later. But again, now we need to tell the user that this succeeded. So we're going to say, uh, here, hold this. Go ahead. We're going to say, return render template uh, index.html. So this is, again, like done on the front end stuff. Um, so I'm not explaining too much of it. So the idea here is that um, we pull the, uh, again, using Flask request uh, library, we pull the uh, short URL and the long URL that the uh, user sent us in the form. And we're going to insert the, that uh, pairing into our uh, URL map collection. And the idea here is that uh, once it's actually inserted, we want to indicate the, to the user, uh, we want to send them back a web page that says your URL uh, mapping was inserted, right? Like that would that'd be pretty uh, frustrating if you were like a user and you want, went to submit a form and the website didn't tell you anything about what happened, right? So, uh, what the um, uh, what again? What render template is is nice about is that uh, not only will does it provide the logic for sending an entire web page back to the uh, client, but it also lets you send custom messages uh, back to the client as well that can be displayed on that web page. So, uh, logically speaking, uh, what we're gonna do just to like peer a little bit into the HTML code is we're going to send them a message to indicate that the long URL or the long URL short URL mapping was inserted successfully and that the short URL is going to be such and such. So yeah, so if you look at if you look at the python we're sending back the inserted URL and that goes into this HTML file and if it if it ha if it finds it it's going to show this message your short URL is blah 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 blah. Um, so now I'm going to run this and let's see if it works. All right. 
See, suspense is building. I'm gonna run the app. It's probably gonna be fine. Right. Make sure you do a different one though from the one you did before. I think. Sure. So do like I don't know Facebook.com. Just do like FB. Amazing. Wait, the CSS is different too. Oh, that's pretty cool. But anyway, so clearly it worked, right? So, uh, we we submitted the uh the form as the client. Uh, that got put, uh, passed along as an HTTP post request that contained the form data to the server. The server uh, it was able to, using Flask's built-ins, was able to handle that and see that, oh, this is a post request, unpack the data, uh, send it to our MongoDB database, and then once it was inserted successfully, uh, report send the user back a message that says, hey, your uh, thing was inserted successfully, here is your short URL. Okay? So what I'm doing now is I'm just showing you that it's like actually inserted. So what I did was I just connected to my I connected to the database that's on my computer, and if you notice again you can forget about these commands. So I'm just trying to show it worked. It's inserted my foo and google.com from before, and then fb and facebook.com from right now. Um, you, so can, yeah. you can start doing the second part if you want of accessing it. Uh. The, the sh accessing the short. Oh yeah. So uh, first of all, I, w I just want to stop for a second. Uh, any questions at all, whatsoever. Everyone's sort of clear on, on like uh, where we are right now and like what we've done to get to this point. If not, now's the time to like ask, I guess. You look like you have a question. You can ask one, it's all good. Like it's probably to everyone's better meant, right? I didn't my question and uh, No dumb questions, man. So there's all these two truncated URLs, right? Yes. The first one and then the long one, right? Yes. So why do you need a database? Like, Ah, uh, okay, so um, the idea is that, um, so yeah, so intuitively you're thinking, oh, why don't you just store it in a variable? That's probably fine. There's not much really happening here. But the idea is that uh, whenever you run a program, right, and you store things in variables, once that program, like, stops, those variables are, like, gone forever, right? Until, like, you run the program again ostensibly and, like, everything goes, right? So the idea is that, so even though, like, our server's, like, running perpetually in a sense, like, you saw, it just, like, sort of, like, says that the server's running and that's it. If our server were to shut down, we were just to store our data in, um... Variables, if our, for various reason our server were to stop, we'd be in serious trouble because then all our data would be lost, right? So a database in some sense, I mean, it does a lot more than this, but in some sense it gives us a, a way to persistently store our, um, all our data so that in the event that, like, let's say our server shuts down, well, our, da our data won't be affected. Now, there's other ways to do this, to store stuff persistently. Like, you can just store it, like, as a file, for example. But, of course, this is where, like, the added features of a database comes in. I mean, they're not really going to be, like, I guess, like, on, like, show here because we're not doing, like, I guess, like, a terrible amount with respect to like querying and doing like a bunch of complex like stuff like that. But um, the idea is that uh, typically in web applications, this is the, the solution for uh, storing stuff persistently. It's not actually, that's actually a really good question. Yeah, because that's like, you think like, oh, what's the point of a database? We have variables, right? But yeah, that's a really good question. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? That's actually a really good point. So I'm storing this stuff like persistently. That's like- If I shut down my computer and turn it back up, this data will still be there. Shri. Why can't we use files? Why can't we use files for persistence? I mean, we can, but we're choosing to use a database because that's what most people do when they build a web application. Right, Shree? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Shree's playing a little bit of a devil's advocate, but that's okay. We welcome all questions here. All right. Uh, any other questions before we move on? Um, how does the Ah, okay. That's actually another fantastic question. So, uh, thus far, we've been very, very uh, loose with our error checking, and we're going to resolve that once we uh, define the behavior for what we should do. If we have to, time. Yeah, if we have time. Yeah. But yeah, that is a very good question. Actually, uh, there's actually nothing stopping us from doing that right now. If there's duplicates, you're just going to write it. It's going to say, okay, cool, I've written it. Right? Because actually, it turns out we can have duplicate long URLs. So two different people can have different like aliases for google.com or whatever. But what we don't want is we don't want to have two instances of the same short URL because that becomes a problem. Because then you, when you actually go to route it, as we'll see in a bit, that's going to become problematic. So yeah, fantastic questions. All right. <coughs> two more. All right, more questions are popping up. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so actually, this is a feature that we had in mind, but uh, because yeah, so we... If you, there's like a lot of features. All of you guys are asking good questions that we want to implement, but we just don't know if we have time. It's very time contingent. I mean, we can, we can like keep going, like wherever, I guess. Like, I don't know. I don't have really have anywhere to be after this, except like probably go to bed or something or play Overwatch. But, you know, we yeah. But yeah, that's the idea. So 
one option, we're doing the basic option where you can specify your uh, own uh, short URL. But yes, those websites, they do have the feature too. And ours does too. The final product does have that too. So yeah. Uh, not another question in the back. Oh yeah, so just to uh, repeat, so um, are, are, do you understand like the stuff about the client server model? So clients are like any of like these like computers like making requests to servers to like get do stuff generally. So uh, the way then the actual like protocol that's used to like do that stuff is the HTTP protocol, and the GET and POST requests are two different uh, ways that clients can communicate with the server. So a GET request is basically a client telling the server, "Hey, I want this resource." Typically, this is a web page, right? Like when you type in Google.com. Uh, that's a get request because like you're, the client is asking, I want the homepage for Google.com. A post request on the other hand is when the client wants to send data typically. So what this involves is uh, like, again, the example would be creating an account for Gmail, right? I put in my, uh, want my handle, my password, all my contact info, and I send it to Google and uh, hopefully that should create uh, an account. So that gives me, that's a different way to send a request, but it's, it allows me, to, instead of just asking for data, it allows me to send data as well. All right, good. Any other questions in the back? Aha, uh -huh. so um, that's a good question. Uh, did you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, so it's a little difficult to see in the code because this is all like HTML and HTML kind of does it under the hood. But so this button that we have, the submit button, um, it's inside this thing called a form. And once you submit a form, the browser just knows to send an HTTP post request. Um, and yeah, there's really nothing. Yeah, because it's, it's not like, Evident from this code, but that's what that's what happens in the background, I guess. Yeah. If you look at the actual. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah. So um, you can specify the method here. And was it saying that when that button is pressed, send a post request to the server, basically? And then now it's gonna it's gonna be like uh, when Flask gets that, it's gonna be able to unpack it because it's like that's the wonder of Flask, right? It's able to handle and do the heavy lifting for us, so to speak. Can All right. I answer your question. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right. All right. Do you want me to take over? All right. We're going to do a bit of like a, oh, do you want to keep coding or do you want me to yeah, hop in? Good. All right. Awesome. It's like, it's done. All right. Sweet. So, uh, like you had pointed out, uh, or I guess, yeah, like actually everyone was pointing out, like the next step here is that now we have this stuff stored. Let's actually uh, have it so that we can route a short URL to the longer URL and actually re re redirect people. So what we're going to do is much in the same way that, actually, let me clip this on. This is going to get really annoying. Hold up. Okay, so much in the same way that we have this um, apt out route here that routes to us to the homepage that handles the behavior for what to do when we go to the homepage, we're also going to do a, a route that uh, basically uh, tells us what to do when we get like something that isn't like, like is variable input. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here. And I'm going to do apt out route, and instead of doing the uh, index just like we did before. Flask gives us this feature where we can uh, accept variable input to our URLs. Uh, and what you have to do, basically, is uh, specify these angle brackets, which indicates the Flask. Is it curly? Is curly? No, it's angle brackets. Yeah, surprisingly so. And uh, the idea is that now I have to just name my variable inputs so they can be stored in a variable, and I can manipulate it in Flask. And logically speaking, since this is going to handle the behavior for adding short URLs, I'm going to name it short URL, Un perhaps somewhat unsurprisingly. It's become more clear once we start like, coding in it. All right. And similarly to here, I have to actually define a function that's going to handle, uh, that's actually going to do, like, be executed once uh, we, uh, Flask routes us here. So we're going to call that uh, lookup, because really what this route is going to be responsible for is looking up a short URL and trying to find a long URL mapping for it. So, and uh, whereas here we didn't really have any parameters here, we have exactly one parameter, that's going to be whatever input we get to uh, after the uh, slash. So I'm going to name that uh, short URL. All right, we we'll keep going. Sweet. All right, so um, now what we need to do is we need to think about what our behavior is going to look like um, for what we, we what should we do to actually uh, perform this uh, business of looking up the short URL and then redirecting our user to that. So um, does anyone have any ideas how we might do that, like conceptually speaking? So we have our short URL, and what we our objective is just to route it to the long URL. So how might we do that? Do we think? It's like I got a high level. Go ahead. Um, look up the 
short URL in the database? Yeah, so that's the idea, right? So because in, in this route, we had stored this mapping of short URL to long URL, well, our best bet is going to be to try to find the uh, corresponding long URL to the short URL. Okay, and we're going to perform this by using a database query. So actually sort of piggyback off your question, like, oh, well, you know, why not use variables? Why not use uh, files? Well, it's easier for me to query uh, data and actually find data that I want using a database because they provide the a query language with which to do so. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, use the uh, Mongo uh, uh, collection, <coughs> and I'm going to use the find one method, which is just going to allow me to specify uh, a, a query or a document that I want to find a match for, and it's going to return the first one that it finds. All right, and if that's sort of like you alluded to, eventually we're going to want to make sure that that uh, thing is unique, but uh, that is neither here nor there. So uh, we're going to go uh, specify uh, the short URL that we want, and this is all um, the MongoDB query language. It can get very, very complex, but all he's doing right now is basically finding uh, the document or I guess the, the entry where the short URL is equal to the one given by the user. All right, it's cool. So. Um, yeah, so right now I'm just, I'm just asking the database, find me um, a short URL that matches the one I got at this route. OK? So um, the next thing I need to do is um, I need to think about this one. I need to start thinking about my error handling, because now it looks like you can see sort of that like uh, it's going to get a little more complicated, right? Because there is actually no guarantee that whatever the person passes me, there's no guarantee that there's actually going to be a short URL that has a corresponding long URL, right? Like if I just put it in like a, bunch, like a long, long, long string, like, there's no guarantee that uh, that is going to actually be something in the database that, uh, that has that short URL, right? So uh, what I should do here is I should, sort of, I should check to see if my res what my result is to know what I should do. So in particular, if uh, my result is none, that is to say if MongoDB could not find a document that had the short URL that was specified, I should do something different than uh, if I did, in fact, if the result is not none. Does that make sense? So. The easier, the easier one to handle here is um, if result is none, then all I need to do is return some kind of error page to, unfortunately, we have one of these like pre-built. So much like we did render template index.html, we're going to render template uh, an error page. So I'm going to do the same thing, but ret uh, return a different web page to indicate there's, so there's something went wrong uh, with the uh, request. Otherwise, uh, what should I do in the case that MongoDB does find, or am I, I, I make the query to MongoDB, and there is, in fact, a long URL instance for the, the short URL provided? What do you guys think I should do? Well, what's the next step, I guess, in routing to the long URL? Oh, go ahead in the back. Yeah, so I need to redirect. And it's funny that you use the word uh, redirect, because um, there actually is this uh, Flask function called uh, redirect that allows me to redirect to add to a web page or to a different uh, part of my uh, web application. So. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, import, uh, whoa, whoops, this is the, you have the uh, opposite scroll of what I have. That's okay. So much like uh, I imported all this stuff, these like, oh, yeah, so much like I uh, uh, imported all these like Flask built-ins to sort of help me out and do the heavy lifting for me, I'm going to do the same thing here because Flask is a function called redirect that, as the name implies, re can redirect me somewhere to a URL, preferably. Okay? So, oh man, I'm not used to your scrolling. That's okay. Okay, that's, that's fine, no problem. So what I'm going to do, instead of rendering a template, what I'm just going to do is I'm going to return the result of doing, performing a redirect to um, the long URL encoded in my result. Right? And we know that this, this has to be the case that uh, we have a result because um, we know that in, in this else case, the result is not none. So that means there has to be something. The we did, in fact, find something that was uh, useful. Okay, that was like that matched the short URL. And those square brackets that you see there, uh, that's basically saying I want the long URL that's in the result. Right. So yeah, because MongoDB is going to take my query short URL uh, equals whatever short URL is passed. It's going to find the first document that matches it and return the entire document to me. And the document, and at least in PyMongo, is uh, represented as a Python dictionary. So what you do is you, uh, given your variable, you pass it uh, a key and you can pass it a key, and then uh, it'll return the corresponding value. So in this case, the key I'm passing it is long URL. It's going to return, return me the long URL that's stored, that, that key. Yeah, so the document looks something like this, like entirely like this. And then you're going to just extract the long URL from it. Right, but because yeah. yeah, I'm interested in redirecting to the long URL. The short URL is just like sort of a way to get, actually get at that long URL, if that makes sense. All right, any questions so far? Good, OK. Let's see if this stuff actually works, shall we see. So uh, do you remember what the actual short URL was? Uh, FD. 
FB, okay, for Facebook. So, oh, I actually got to say this. Can you do it because I have no idea what your key is. Oh, whoops. Yeah. Right. I was going to say, I have no idea what terminal you have it under. So, does it restart it? Okay. So now, if we go to the, um, if we actually go to um, oh, yeah. this URL, localhost slash FB, in theory, now it should redirect me, hopefully. Oh, when's it? Oh, oh, okay. Oh, you got uh... to specify. I think we have to, uh, okay, so there's a couple of issues now that we have. So this is where the error checking comes in, right? So does anyone have a guess as to why this didn't work? So what it did, what it did try to do is it tried to redirect us to localhost uh, 500 slash www.facebook.com. Um, does anyone know why that might be the case? I'm curious to see if anyone actually knows. So this is an error that we actually should, we should handle, but um, does anyone have any guesses? Oh yeah, so I think, all right, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. So uh, the idea here is that um, we didn't actually validate our URL when we actually inserted it, our long URL. There was nothing, so uh, much in the same way that there's nothing stopping me from putting any like sort of short URL I want into the, this routing function, uh, we didn't do any checks against, uh, well, what happens if the person puts in a bogus URL? Does that make sense? So even though www.facebook.com is a legit URL, the problem is, is that it's not prepended with uh, an HTTP uh, colon slash slash. So uh, what the redirect function thinks is that I'm trying to redirect to this route, but in reality, I want to uh, redirect it to HTTP dot slash slash Facebook.com. Does that make sense? So the problem is, fundamentally, this is sort of like uncovered an error that we sort of glossed over, and intentionally so, that we didn't do any sort of error checking when we were inserting these collections. Does that make sense? So let's go ahead and fix it. All right, so wait, I also I have to leave in eight minutes. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, shit. Can you do the last eight minutes of coding? I mean, yeah. I can. <laughs> so, like, basically, so like, the easy way to do this is just, just add this here. So the easy way to do this is just add HTTPS before your long URL when you insert it. That's not obviously a long-term, like, st uh, sustainable way because you need to make sure that... No, hold on. Yeah, exactly. So there's, there's yeah. a couple of ways. So the thing is, what we, the long-term solution is, and you'll see this in like the actual like final code, is that um, we basically check to see if HTTP or HTTP is like part of like the string, and if not, we append it. So here, let me just pull up the actual code now and walk through that in the last like few minutes. Um, so yeah. But you can see that this is the sort of thing that you need to think about, right? Like we define like sort of the base logic, but now what's really tripping us up, or what's like causing our app from actually working, is we didn't do any of like the error checking or validation needed. But and that's actually like half the battle with like these sorts of like uh, web applications. So. Yeah, so now if you look here, when I get the URL from the form, I actually call this one method called validate URL. And that actually does all the hard work for us. So if I go down here, this is how the method looks like. I check if it starts with HTTPS. Um, and then if it does, or no, sorry, I check if it doesn't start with HTTPS or HTTP. And if it doesn't, then I just manually add it in. Um, and then, so do you know what this function is, URL open? Yes. All right, so, I don't know what it is. You can explain. Okay. So, um, so the HTTP part is one part of validation, but the other part is that, well, what happens if, like, uh, someone gave me, like, a totally bogus URL that doesn't even work if I try to, like, uh, you know, try, like, actually try to prepend to HTTP with it, right? Like, what if they gave me, like, ABCDEF? That's actually probably a real website, but, like, bear with me. Um, if someone gave me, like, a, a totally, like, random string, um, the idea first is before we actually insert into our database, we have to make sure it actually works as a website, like it's an actual legitimate web website. So, much like Flask had all those useful functions like render template, redirect, and request, and so on and so forth, they also have another useful function called URL open that allows us to try to uh, access a URL. And so what we do here is we attempt to open the URL that the long URL uh, is supposed to be, and judging based on the status code uh, that HTTP tells us, we can discern whether or not it's uh, a legitimate website. So. Uh, a general rule with HTTP, uh, we, we sort of talked about that, the HTTP response code. So that's like the way that uh, after like, some kind of request, the server can indicate the status of the request to the client. The general uh, rule, if I'm not mistaken, is that any HTTP request that's uh, equal to or above 400, so 400 and above, so like 404, 500, so on and so forth, that generally designates an error. Anything below 400 is generally uh, a non-error. So it's like a status code that indicates like, I don't know, Deletion was successful, operation was successful, uh, so on and so forth. So the way that we do, what we do basically here is we attempt to uh, open the URL, and if we get a status code greater than or equal to 400, well, that means that there's something wrong with this URL, so we're going to reject it, and uh, we're going to indicate as such, because we're going to return a blank string, and if we scroll back up, 
to our uh, server code. If the URL is nothing, well, we're going to indicate that uh, we're going to return the homepage and we're going to say that the long URL is invalid for whatever reason. Okay. So does that make sense to everyone what, I sort of, what we sort of did there? So it's twofold. Oh, yeah. Do you have a question? No, no. Oh, yeah. You're saying, yeah, yeah I do. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the idea is that the validation is twofold. We have to make sure that HTTP is part of the string. And, if, and even, though, even if it might be, we have to then go and verify that the URL actually works before we submit it to our database. Because if we allow bad URLs to be in our database, well, our service isn't going to work as promised, right? Like, if they try to access your URL and they get nothing in return, the user would obviously be frustrated, right? So, yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? So I think we're kind of yeah. like running <laughs> short on time. Yeah, I mean, so I can just, I can walk through some of this other stuff. This is to answer your question, right, about random, or I don't know if it was you or someone. It was someone in the back who asked about how to make random. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so so like, yeah. If, if the short URL that the user provides is empty, then we have this function called gen random string. Um, and all that does is just Python has some inbuilt functions, um, you know, random characters and all that stuff. And we have some allowed characters, so we want to make sure the URL doesn't have any semicolons or all that stuff. So we basically, in this, in this method, we have a random string of like length seven that we get, and we make sure that this one doesn't already exist. So we check as long as uh, this database doesn't already have this random URL, um, then you can return this random URL. And then once we get that back up here, then we can insert it into the database and render our success, success page. page. Yeah. And then the last thing I want to address is the um, concern about, well, how do we guarantee that the short URLs that we pass are unique? Well, uh, let me ask you, how, would you, how do you think that we, I mean, it's, it's actually probably visible right now, but how, do you, uh, how would you propose that we uh, validate that a URL is uh, unique, do we think? So what would be the logical thing to do to verify that give, the user gives us a short URL and that short URL is unique? Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, look in the database. Yeah, so, I mean, we can only know, know if a URL is respect unique with respect to the database, right? So when we're given a short URL, let's see if it exists. And if it already exists, well, that means it's not unique, and we're going to reject the uh, suggestion. If uh, the database query returns nothing, then it must mean that that short URL has not been used yet. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's exactly what we do here. Um, we find in the database that particular short URL. If it's empty, then we know we're good because it doesn't already exist, so we insert it. Uh, but if it's not empty, um, we throw the error page with this message saying short URL already exists. Um, and that pretty much completes most of the, yeah, pretty much everything else we had in here. Does anyone have any questions in general about anything? Yeah. So, um, so usually, it's like, so I know we're like running this locally, but let's say if it was actually displayed like on the web, um, and we created a tiny URL that some other like ten URLs generator already kind of used. So how would you kind of make sure that the tiny URLs you generated could get? That's a good question. So um, to answer that basically is that because we have, we are, let's say like Bitly, let's say it's like probably the most popular one. Bitly, they have their own service and their own database that maintains their own records and their server is responsible for routing their short URL to long URL mappings. And so they're not responsible for ours, right? Because actually Bitly has no, has like no idea about our, because Bitly has access to the, only their own database and not ours or anyone else's. They're, they can only, their service is only useful for, uh, Map like routing their short URLs to long their long URLs. So, so like if you have if you have something like bit.ly slash like something right, that's gonna route to something some long website. But if you do if you do like uh, like goo.gl, I think that's like their thing. And that's gonna go to a complete different website. Like they have no relationship to each other, right? So the services exist independently. So it's the goo dot the goo.gl and bit.ly like take you to different like things. Okay, so like Yeah, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Because exactly. they have their own records, we have our own records. So that's an experiment you can even try. Like you can try like to create a tiny URL, uh, URL, and try to see if it works on uh, Bitly. And the it's not going to work. Like most certainly. So, yeah. Does that make answer your question? Yeah. All right. Any other questions before we uh, wrap this up? In the back. Sure. Uh. So the idea is that um, as long as you install the dependencies, so as long as you install MongoDB, as long as you install Flask and all of its related dependencies, um, it's it, it will work on any run on any computer. Yeah, so you can you can download this code after and like run it on your own laptop or whatever. Yeah, so, yeah. so like you can't access it right now. So right now, well, actually, are, are this uh, your, this repository is public? So actually, um, no, I meant like, like you 
Oh, are you saying like you, you can, like would you be able to actually like access like the running server right now? Yeah. So no, because uh, when you run something locally, it's only it's not actually available on the internet. It's just available on the respect that one machine. So, uh, I guess the larger question is then, does anyone know how we would actually make this like open to like the larger uh, world? Let's say like how would we like, make it so that people besides us on our, on our computer? Yeah, so the idea is that we would have to uh, host it on a server with public IP address that would make it visible to the uh, to the rest of the world. Or, like, yeah, and most people do this with, like, uh, AWS or whatever, or, like, Heroku or something. I like Heroku, it's easier, but whatever. It's pre personal preference, really. All right, any other questions? Going once, going twice? All right, well, thank you all for coming out tonight on this uh, Friday night. Hopefully you learned something, and uh, I'll be after for a bit if anyone wants to ask anything.